Good morning and welcome. My name is Emma Wall and I'm a member of the wonderful Ebby family. Today's talk comes towards the end of our current series, which is about our journey through life. And the title that I've been given is For the Journey, Suffering. What I bring to you this morning is the culmination of several weeks of waiting on God for today's message. And I bring what I feel confidently that God has given me from the incredible book of Job. It's interesting that Johnny mentioned learning styles earlier. I didn't know he was going to do that because although my favoured learning style is as a visual learner, I'm aware that not everybody is. And that some folk may find lots of slides a bit distracting. So to be as inclusive as possible, I've paired my slides down for today. Some of you might be quite pleased to hear. In the Ebby prayer room in September, a lament area had been created, which had this pinned up on the wall above it. One of the most undervalued and misunderstood parts of scripture are the lament passages. Job faces and experiences many unanswered questions and tormented wrestling. The lament passages of scripture are there to sit with us in our pain. Though it appears all trace of God's presence has left, these passages mysteriously, mysteriously convey to us the truth that God is not simply trying to rush us out of pain, but rather, first and foremost, being with us in it. I find that such a helpful perspective. Last month, I went with a friend to a women's conference near Cheltenham, where the speaker, Anita Cleverly, gave a talk entitled Deep Night, Bright Morning, in which she described how a staff member from their church was killed in an accident on her way to work. This is how Anita reflected on her church's grieving process. Pain is the gift that none of us want. Christians often feel as if everything has to be all right. I don't know if, as a church, we knew how to lament before this happened. We need to learn how to sit with our pain. In the summary to Job in my NIV version of the Bible, it reads, Rare is the person who has not, at one time or another, had to explore the most difficult questions of life. Why is there pain, suffering and heartache? Where is God when it hurts? These are all such valid questions and maybe they're questions that you have often asked. If we are to know more of God, I think that it is inevitable that we will need to learn to grow through the hard times. Where I'm going today is looking at what it is to be open to learning from our suffering and how we can choose to make our pain count. Because what we do with our pain is always a choice. A choice that only we can make. I thought about giving context to today's passage in Job, particularly for those who might be unfamiliar with the Bible, by saying what happens in the chapters before and what happens in the chapters after. But I realised that hindsight is a wonderful thing when we see how everything turns out in the end. It's so much easier to understand our journey when we get to our destination and look back. But what about when we are in the middle of our journey and when that journey is defined by suffering? What then? Today I want you to see Job in the middle of his tormented wrestling when he doesn't know how it's all going to end. In his foreword to Never Too Far, Louis Giglio writes, we all share one thing in common. In all our lives, there will be winds that blow, headwinds of difficulty brought on by our own decisions and gale force winds of adversity due to circumstances we never saw coming. For me, the book of Job perfectly represents the circumstances that were not seen coming. It is a chance for us looking in through the window to see how a man of faith bears up in the midst of the devastating unexpected. 
Before I read from our chapter that falls almost slap bang in the middle of Job, I will point out that the chapters before it consist of conversations between Job, his wife and his circle of close friends who are trying to get their heads around the tragedies that in very quick succession led to Job's 7,000 sheep being destroyed by fire, his 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys being carried away by Sabian marauders, his body being covered with agonizing sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head, and the death of his seven sons and three daughters when a mighty wind destroyed the house where they were eating together, killing them all instantly. This is what Job says to his friends about his current view of God. Then Job replied, even today my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling, I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Let me begin with the three words of verse one. Then Job replied, let us not be rendered mute by our pain. Let us be brave enough to be honest with our friends, with God and with ourselves. Let us be prepared to give our reply. We see in this short but poignant verse that Job is in conversation with his friends. Conversation is a vital thing. It is two-way. It is a chance for us to give our perspective and it is a chance for us to be listened to and to be heard. For my birthday this year, my good friend Hazel gave me what has become one of my favourite bookmarks. It's of a sculpture of Saint Benedict who is known as the Listening Saint because what others said mattered to him, and he was someone who heard people. What a wonderful thing to be remembered for. Sometimes you need to draw closer to somebody in order to hear them. When you give your reply about what's going on in your life, to friends, to family, to God, do you feel heard? I know who I am heard by, and I am incredibly thankful for them. In verse 2, Job says, even today, my complaint is bitter. If I was to ask you now to think of someone who you see as being a bitter person, I wonder if your mind goes straight to a character from a favourite film, or maybe someone from work, or closer to home, perhaps a family member. Or maybe... It is closer still, and it is yourself who you think of. In my experience, people don't become bitter without reason. What struck me the most in C.S. Lewis's book, The Problem of Pain, is that halfway through, he begins to use a capital letter for pain. Isn't that so true in our lives? That pain so often dominates us looms so large, overshadows our joy, and sometimes causes us to become bitter. As I said earlier, I think that we must be so careful about what we choose to do with our pain. I love what Joyce Mayer exhorts us to do with it in Let God Fight Your Battles, when she writes, I encourage you not to waste your pain. He has given me beauty for ashes, just as he promised in Isaiah 61, verse 3. 
but I had to let go of the ashes. Maybe you feel as if you live among ashes in a place where pain, regret, disappointment, the blindsiding unexpected have reduced your dreams to dust. Is it time for you to choose to swap your ashes for beauty? You won't get a better exchange anywhere. I wonder if verse three resonated with you, if only I knew where to find him. Maybe you're someone who has looked for God for seemingly ages and you don't feel as if you found him yet. Or maybe you're someone who discovered him a long time ago, but for whatever reason, suddenly he doesn't seem as present or apparent in your life as you'd like him to be. Maybe it almost seems as if he's hiding from you, as if somehow he has suddenly become an absentee God to you. In his book, God on Mute, Pete Gregg writes about how we often want God to airlift us out of our problems, but how more often than not, God parachutes in and joins us right there in the middle of them. But what if he doesn't? Here in verse 3, there is no sign of God landing right there next to Job in the centre of his pain. Job is very clear that God, when he needs him the most, is nowhere to be seen. Next, let me come to the heartbreaking verses of 8 and 9, which I feel are at a different level again. This is more than someone asking, where can I find God? This is someone going through one of the most painful episodes of their life, who is actively seeking God out, who is metaphorically going to the four corners of the globe, and yet finds that God is strangely absent. Do you know what that feels like? And then we come to the verse that I think is a pivot point in the whole chapter, a yet, a despite, a but kind of a verse where Job proclaims, but, but, he knows the way that I take. Job has a certainty that he is known by his God. And I think that feeling known by God makes all the difference to him. Do you feel as if God knows you? There is something else that I think cuts both ways in this time of Job's tormented wrestling. Something that is probably more important than Job being known by God. Something that has run such a seam of resilience through the person of Job that has made the Japanese proverb, Nana Kurobi Yaoki, true in his life. Fall down seven times, stand up eight That's something that always means that Job gets back up onto his feet one more time than the times that he fell. And that's all it takes for any of us. One more time. And that something that makes the key difference is quite simply that Job knows his God. Job doesn't merely believe in God or merely trust in God. Job believes God. Job trusts God. And that's different. Job chooses to trust God despite the devastating losses, despite his anguished questions, despite his dreams turned now to dust. Do you trust God? Do you know the promises that God makes to you in the Bible? Because you can't recognise that he's keeping them if you don't know them in the first place. In 11 and 12, Job says, My feet have closely followed his steps. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Verse 11 really reminded me of a verse that is very significant to me and Johnny. In mid-August, we had the pleasure of celebrating 20 years of happy marriage. 
and throughout September we marked the occasion in a variety of ways with family and friends. And I was reminded again of the inscription of Johnny's favourite Bible verse engraved inside his wedding band two decades ago now. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. God's words, his wisdom, his commands, his instructions, his promises, light my Johnny's path on his journey through life. And they lit Job's path too. Despite the horrific trials that he endured, they mattered to him. In Never Too Far, Louis Giglio writes, I don't know what you've lost, and I don't know what place you're in right now, but I know this, God isn't finished with you yet. You might not run the exact race you thought you would be running, but God still has a race for you. Job knew what it was to choose to put one foot in front of the other, even though the route wasn't at all like what he'd planned or hoped for. How might treasuring God's word help us to do the same? A year ago this month, I was delivering a talk on one of my all-time favourite subjects, which some of you will know straight away what I'm going to say, manure, which sadly I haven't got time to elaborate on here. <laughs> but which involves digging in those difficult, seemingly worthless challenges and making sure that nothing is wasted, even pain, and that everything matters. A woman came up to me afterwards asking for me to pray that she would have the strength and fortitude to dig in what she described as a dumper truck of manure that had recently, metaphorically, been dumped on her doorstep. We arranged to meet up once back in Bristol, and two months later, I felt God nudge me to invite her to join the Women's Bethmore Bible Study that I run at my house. Three courses later, I have seen that now a friend's life literally transformed. I've seen her delve so deep into the Bible over the past year, and I have seen her mine sustaining jewels of God's truth from those depths. I have seen God's word truly being a lamp to her feet that lights her journey along a path that is a different one than the one she expected or even hoped that it would be. I have seen her tirelessly and resolutely dig in the manure that is already making a rich, fertile basis from which fantastic, fruitful things are emerging, and she can see them too. These concepts lead so well into the amazing verses in Psalm 84 that I have been asked to include alongside Job 23, and which are amongst my favourite in the Bible. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. I've researched the Valley of Baca and it has been translated as being the Valley of Weeping or the Valley of Tears. One commentator described it as a place where everything seems hopeless and you feel helpless like the pit of despair. Maybe you are well acquainted with that place. The steadfast pilgrims on their journey through that desolate bleak valley were called so clearly to transform it as they travelled through. We are those same pilgrims today. We too are called to refresh people's wildernesses and places of pain with springs of living water. We too are called to transform them. Over the past year, I have seen my new friend of manure fame set her heart on pilgrimage, treasures God's words and find her strength in him. I have seen her choose to make her tears count and not let her pain go to waste. It isn't lost on me that only this week 
She has gone on her first visit to a Christian-run homeless hostel for women in the centre of town, where she will join her Springs of Hope with others, Psalm 84, Springs of Living Water, that transform our Bristol women's wildernesses and valleys of Bacca in a safe oasis of love and hope. Next week, she will return for training. I will finish today by returning to the subject of light, as it is one that I feel passionate about, and it also relates to the transformational springs of Psalm 84. Written on the Mental Health and Wellbeing Board just over there is this profound statement. The key to recovery is to see there is a flicker of light, no matter how dark things may feel. Light is an incredible thing. Light always, always puts out darkness, but darkness can never, ever extinguish light. In Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said to his disciples, as he says to us today, these incredible words, you are the light of the world. I believe so strongly that we are not called to stand in the wonderful light at the end of the tunnel that we're enjoying, cajoling and merely calling encouragements to those struggling deep within it. As I've quoted before in his book, Deep and Wide, Andy Stanley writes this, if you want me to follow you on a journey, you have to come get me. The journey must begin where I am, not where you are or where you think I should be. I think that God sends us to people where they are, in their dark tunnels, often marked by pain, carrying with us lit orbs, candles, headlamps, flickers of light, flaming torches, flashlights, lanterns, lit with the light of his word, of his truth, of his forgiveness, but most of all, of his love. A lamp for their feet and a light for their path on the journey through this thing called life. Finally, still in the middle of his suffering, still with his herds and flocks stolen, still with his body raw with sores, still with his children wiped out in an instant. This is what Job proclaims in the last verse of chapter 23. Yet, yet, I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. Pain can so easily silence us and cover our faces, preventing us from seeing things that give us hope. Our journey through life is more about more than wealth, status, even happiness, but more about how we choose to make our pain count, who we become and who we're living for. The journey matters even when it involves suffering. Near the beginning of the final chapter of Job, before his herds and flocks are replaced many times over, before he goes on to father more sons and daughters and see their children to the fourth generation, before we read that God blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first, before all that, this is what Job testified. My ears had heard of you, but now, but now, my eyes have seen you. Let us pray. Dear Father God, help us never to stop growing through the experience that we have on our journey through life. 
however challenging they might feel at times. I pray that you will give us the strength and resilience to dig our manure in, to be those who choose carefully what to do with our pain, so that it is used to powerful effect and none of it is wasted. I pray that you will remove any bitterness as suffering might have grown in us and that you will redeem the places where it has managed to dominate and overshadow our joy. May we know what it is to be those who transform people's valley of Baca, their places of tears, with a different kind of water that refreshes and leads to fruitfulness and new growth. Put your light in our hands and may we carry it into people's dark tunnels to where they are so that it can be a lamp to their feet and a light to their path. And may our ears not only hear of you, but like Job did, despite our circumstances, despite the pain that we might experience on our journey, may we too see you, God. Amen.